How could there be a God who would allow so much suffering to occur in the world? People who reject the notion of the existence of God often pose this question as their basis for doing so. When they ask it, they're not really asking. They're actually using it as a rhetorical question that they think is unanswerable and therefore proves their position. They think the question has no answer because they have never heard a satisfactory one. I believe that too many Christians and Jews are unable to answer the question, though they should be able to. The fact is that the answer to the question is given plainly enough in the first book of the Old Testament, if we are willing to accept it. Perhaps it is because the explanation may make us uncomfortable that we choose not to comprehend it. This may be an inconvenient truth for many to reckon with, but I do also have words of encouragement in conclusion. The book of Genesis describes how God created human beings to live in a state of perfect harmony with Him, free of stress, worry, pain, or even the possibility of death, in a place where all of their needs were met. For example, in that time and place, every seed-bearing herb and tree fruit was given to them for food. Genesis 1.30 Scripture also indicates that there were not even thorns on the ground or the trees. This is no longer the reality, as many plants and fruits now are poisonous and thorny, but the reason for such changes will become clear in a moment. God was explicit that, in order to maintain that state of spiritual harmony and immortality in His immediate presence, there was one condition that these humans must meet, not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2.15 Now there is ample speculation as to exactly what the tree of knowledge of good and evil was, or whether it was actually anything physical. Might it have been a mind-altering substance or some forbidden occult knowledge? I believe that it was a metaphor in any case. Nonetheless, what can be understood is the overall significance it had and the consequences to humanity of this forbidden enlightenment. A tree is a branching growth, and its fruit is the end result. As for the growth of what... It was clearly the knowledge of good and evil. Now, at that time, Adam and Eve had no concept of good or evil. As we can understand, their life conditions were certainly good, but they had nothing to contrast that with. You could say that they didn't know how good they had it. However, they were coaxed by Satan, in the form of the subtle serpent who persuaded them that God had lied to them when he said that they would surely die if they were to do what he warned them not to do, only because he was concerned that humans might rival him if they did not obey, as they would become wise like gods themselves, Satan told them. Genesis 3-4 So easily deceived and eager for the promised wisdom, these humans went ahead and defied God's commandment by partaking of the fruit of the tree. Genesis 3.6 It is clear that Satan, the serpent, desired for Adam and Eve, which I interpret as having been the first men and women, to accept this knowledge because their doing so would support his aims. Upon doing so, these first humans became self-conscious and ashamed of their natural condition. Their perception of reality was altered in such a way that they began to concern themselves with issues which had not mattered to them before. They became paranoid about what was proper or improper, as their minds were suddenly flooded by the sophisticated notion of evaluating right and wrong, whereas they had previously only experienced what was right and good. Genesis 3.7 these first humans, in accepting this fruit of the knowledge of good and evil of their own free will, evidenced their susceptibility to the influence of Satan and the ease with which he could persuade them to defy the will of God, thusly sowing the first seeds of sin in their lives, which would then grow and multiply over successive generations. 
this new paradigm was incompatible with the pure and simple, immortal state of existence that God had initially established for his children. Then, Satan, seeing just how vulnerable humans were to his corruption of their thoughts and actions, would have become emboldened to continue to corrupt mankind until the end of time. Well, this necessitated the expulsion of humans from the paradise where they enjoyed only the good without any contrasts, which was God, love, joy, and life, into the only sort of environment that was compatible with their newly altered perception of reality, which required discernment between the new dichotomies of good and evil, God and Satan, love and hate, joy and suffering, life and, of course, death. It is as though they had said, regardless what God wants for us, we want the wisdom to distinguish between good and evil. And in response to that, it is as though God said, as you wish, since you want to know the difference between good and evil, then from now on, both will be present in your lives, and the difference will be abundantly clear. Understand that human's original sin was choosing to be able to discern between good and evil. In order for the discernment of one thing from another to be possible, the distinctions between the two must actually exist. They made the choice to migrate from a reality in which only the force of good had any tangible power into one where both good and evil were distinctly present and active, and that is the world in which we live. In this world, Satan is permitted to exercise a degree of executive authority, whereas, it may be inferred, he was restrained from directly causing harm and limited to his power of suggestion over humans while they were in Eden. Thus it becomes clear that Satan's objective in tempting mankind to defy God in Eden was to have them transported from that safe haven to this realm where his power is greater. From the moment that those original humans asked for this present worldly reality, Life for every person since then effectively became a test of loyalty to God, precisely as it would need to be in the midst of the ongoing spiritual and physical struggle between the forces of good and evil here. What we must accept is that Satan, the source of negativity in our lives, is ultimately due to our own human fault, our natural inclination to abuse the gift of free will, by rebelling against the one who granted it to us. Although it is said that we were created in God's image, it is never said that we were perfect reflections of God. The fact that we were granted free will by God to choose to obey or disobey Him shows that it was not His intention to create exact replicas of Himself in all of His perfection. As if that had been the case, then there would never have been any reason to allow us a choice to contradict his wisdom and divine will. As for why we suffer for the sins of our forebearers, or from seemingly arbitrary and random tragedies such as natural disasters, rather than suffering only the consequences of sins that we have personally committed, keep in mind that the introduction of evil and chaos is something that humanity ushered in long ago against God's will. Our forebearers chose to interpret his commandment as a tyrannical dictate, rather than the merciful warning that it was. Moreover, when one considers how much evil is done by men in the world in our present time, it is obvious that we have no more right to expect God to simply believe that he has our unwavering obedience than the first people who rebelled against him did, and as such, we are no more worthy of his mercy than they were. Although we are unable to undo original sin to banish the general presence of evil in the world, we can still humble ourselves before God, be thankful for what we are given, ask forgiveness for our personal transgressions, pray for strength and wisdom in our daily lives, and dedicate ourselves to God in recognition of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We are thereby afforded eternal spiritual protection, and sometimes able to also minimize temporal physical suffering. 
Satan attempts to leverage the pain that we experience in this world as a means of convincing us that there is no God, or to shake our fists toward heaven and curse his name. And he has surely damned many souls in this way. However, it is we, due to our imperfect and inconstantly loyal human nature, who are in the position to prove ourselves worthy of the grace of God, not the other way around. This is what we must understand when we are faced with suffering. We should also consider that the demonic forces amassed at the borders of our reality are kept at bay from swiftly annihilating us all, only by the grace and authority of the Lord our God. God has compassion for his children and does not desire for us to suffer pain and sorrow, except perhaps in circumstances which can actually benefit our spiritual growth, such as to better acquaint us with the virtue of compassion. When we suffer tremendously, it is not unusual to feel as though we have become the pain, that pain is the total of our being. This is how Satan would like for us to feel. However, we must keep in perspective that, in the grand scheme of creation over which God presides, the experience of physical or emotional pain in this world is essentially a biological process of electrochemical reactions, and that physical death is neither the end of existence nor of our cherished bonds with our loved ones. One way or another, all pain shall eventually pass, and we are assured that we will be reunited with our loved ones in the presence of God and His Son Jesus Christ, as long as we make that choice while we are here. 